So hello everyone. In today's lecture I want to basically discuss many different meta programming options for DSL implementation. In fact, this uh, lecture today is based on a paper uh, from uh, 2017 that we published in the Software Language Engineering Conference. So uh, the, the paper's title is A Christomity of DSL Implementations. You probably don't know the term Christomity. Think of it collection. So, okay, uh, let me motivate this topic. So why would we want to discuss uh, meta programming options for DSL implementation? Well, basically because there are lots of options and it's interesting to understand the trade-offs of different options. So here uh, in this lecture, we will basically work with a finite state machine language, basically very simple modeling language. Um, like here we have an example in the visual syntax uh, with some states and some transitions. And what I'm showing here is I'm actually showing different syntaxes uh, for the same language. So for example, here, uh, this is essentially um, sort of a so-called fluent API to create exactly the same finite state machine as shown here uh, to create it by certain method calling chains. Okay, and here we have a more textual uh, concrete syntax. Uh, maybe we need to implement a parser for that. Or here we have the option that uh, the finite state machine syntax is actually embedded into some host language, uh, maybe Scala or Haskell. We will get into this. So we can implement uh, FSM language in many different ways, uh, internally, externally, uh, with an API. We can go for visual syntax, for uh, textual syntax, and there are many other variations. Just to um, show you one approach, so here we go for the external DSL approach, uh, which means we sort of develop a standalone tool, especially parser for the language at hand. And in this case, we use the Antler parser generator, which uh, basically works like this, that we uh, do not just describe the context-free grammar uh, for the input language for the finite state machines, but we also enrich those um, rules with semantic actions. In our case here, we use Java code embedded into the uh, grammar rules and the purpose of these um, semantic actions in this case here is that we build up an object graph in Java which represents the finite state machine that has been parsed. So I mean you see this here that we have like constructor calls and that we add some states here or we add some transitions here with these semantic actions. So this is how we basically parse the input according to a concrete textual syntax and we build an object graph uh, of which you can think as a sort of abstract syntax representation um, which we can then use for further processing. Uh, now let's assume uh, we have this textual input and now we want to have um, visual uh, representation. Let's say we want to visualize a finite state machine. I mean, um, as a poor man's form of um, graphic um, concrete syntax. So we want to basically generate such a graph here. And um, well, so we could use, for example, the graphist tool with its dot language to actually describe the relevant graphs. So this is what we do here. This is uh, how we describe the graph on the right in this dot language of graph is. And now we just have to build a generator that basically translates our FSM abstract syntax or whatever we have into this sort of dot based representation. And well, uh, rather than going for the um, Java based abstract syntax using a Java object graph. Uh, let's assume that we want to implement this visualizer in Python. So we assume that we maybe use some JSON format um, to be able to 
uh, interchange uh, FSMs in this JSON-based abstract syntax. So now we can have actually multiple languages aboard, like we can have a parser with Antler plus Java, and maybe then that parser should then um, serialize the object graph into such a JSON object. And now we can maybe go for a Python-based program, namely this one here, uh, which takes such a, a Python um, object while well, by deserializing the uh, JSON object, and then it uh, generates uh, the appropriate dot representation. And actually in this case, what we do here is, as you see, we, we have this uh, API here, PyGraphis, which is basically an internal uh, in DSL implementation of the dot language, so we don't generate text for for the graphics tool, now we rely on these uh, on this API here, and we invoke it like this, and that, in that way, we exactly um, behind the scene we we generate a dot output that we were showing earlier. Okay. Now, yeah. Okay, so we can parse uh, our FSMs. Maybe we can check them. Uh, that uh, for various uh, FSM-like properties, I didn't talk about this. We can visualize them. Surely we can also interpret them or simulate them. Uh, well, what else is there? Uh, what else could we do if we want to implement uh, this or some other DSL? Well, first of all, maybe we want to have comprehensive IDE support for the DSL. We, obviously, we don't have this here. We just have a parser um, and some functionality. Or maybe we actually want to properly embed the DSL into an existing host language so that we can, for example, mix, let's say, Java or Haskell with FSM code. Um, maybe we also want to have graphical editing for the DSL, not just the visualization that we discussed. And also maybe we want to implement some sophisticated optimizations. Well, this is interesting for many uh, non-trivial DSLs. There's not too much to be done here for uh, this simple FSML. All right, so yeah, so these are all the kinds of things we could do. And here's some indications of how some of these things would feel like. For example, here we have some Haskell code. I mean, this is a Haskell function, right? Well, in fact, a constant, if you like. And you see here, here we use the so-called quasi-quotation notation with this uh, bracket here and then FSML, we switch from Haskell to a different language. And you see in here, we can actually use the actual FSML textual syntax, right? So this is this is some uh, extension of Haskell that we can have so-called quasi-quotation here. Uh, basically, it allows us really to embed languages into Haskell. Um, a little bit on how this works. Well, under the hood, what happens when this uh, FSML texture syntax is parsed, it generates some normal Haskell term, you know, which we would normally write in Haskell if we didn't have that quasi-quotation uh, support, okay? And in order to actually tell Haskell that it can have these quasi-quotations for FSML, we have to, it's sort of a plug-in kind of mechanism. We have to define somewhere so-called FSML quasi-quoter. Uh, this is a bunch of functions. Most importantly, uh, it, it's this quoting function here. As you see, it essentially consists of a parsing function. Uh, we can perform some um, checks. And then here, uh, we need to convert the parsing result um, into uh, Haskell syntax, if you like, right? Because in the end, um, the concrete syntax of the FSML is sort of reparsed as a Haskell expression. Okay, it's a little bit complicated, uh, but it allows us um, quite powerfully to add other languages, to embed them into Haskell. Or here's a different meter programming system. It's called Rascal. It's a, it's mostly, let's say, a powerful language. Uh, so we see some snippet of the language here. Well, um, one of the distinguished features of this meter programming language Rascal is that it has 
embedded support for grammars. So think of Java, but suddenly within Java, you can write grammars. So here, here we have the grammar of, um, of the uh, final state machine language. Okay. And um, another interesting aspect of this particular meter program system, Rascal, is that um, there is no distinction between concrete and abstract syntax. Instead, concrete syntaxes are used everywhere. So you can even write code, like rewriting rules or of functions that directly process um, the concrete syntax of the relevant language. So that's, that's quite cool. We see this on the next slide. So here you see, I mean, this is again Rascal and you see it feels a little bit like, I don't know, Java, Scala, whatever. And um, this is some code here um, uh, where we do some checking and some pre-processing of the uh, FSML um, input. But one thing I want to point out here is this is, for example, how you see that, for example, like in, in case discrimination here, you perform those cases on the actual concrete syntax. So you don't have any object representation of FSMs here. You really uh, operate uh, at the level of concrete syntax. Yeah, just to point out some specifics. Um, maybe also some architectural diagram here on another major option. So this is about a, a special um, system, small talk based system called Helvieta. Um, and so it's basically an architecture that allows you to plug into a traditional small talk compiler in such a way that you can intercept or replace or augment certain standard phases in a compiler. So normally what we see down here, this is the traditional parse. So you have some source code, you parse it, you perform some semantic analysis and you uh, generate bytecode, you get the executable code. Okay. Um, now, as you see here, there are different uh, ways to augment this behavior. So, for example, you might actually uh, refine the parser, which means you, you kind of step out of the, the baseline parse like this. Or maybe you use the, the existing parser, but you perform a different transformation. So, by sort of actually revising the interpretation of the, the syntax or um, you actually plug into the bytecode generation and you change the kind of code that's generated. And for all these interception or, or augmentation passes, there are viable applications for this ML implementation. Okay. Um, so there are, there's really a whole bunch of different passes to advanced DSM implementation. We can use graphical editors. We can use extensible languages. I was just showing Haskell a little bit. Uh, extensible compilers. I was just giving you a small talk like example. There are these meter programming languages or systems. I was showing you a Rascal for this purpose. And then there are language workbenches. These are basically meter programming systems, including IDE support. Okay. So what, what is the conclusion here? Well, it might feel like that this is a very crowded, um, complicated situation. Uh, there are just too many paths to Rome. I mean, there's too many ways how we can implement the DSL and it's really hard to understand it at a more conceptual level, at a more general level. It feels like we have to learn all these different meter programming languages and notations and maybe play with all these different uh, workbenches and other systems. Um, so this is a little bit unsatisfactory, but this is exactly where our work um, basically starts. So we thought, okay, we should build some sort of library, some sort of collection of DSL implementations. 
Um, and the nature of this collection is, and I will explain more in detail what a crestomity is. Yes, the nature of this collection is that it is sort of useful for learning. Um, yes, and that's actually more or less what a crestomity is. Uh, a collection of uh, utterances in some language uh, that is useful for learning. Okay. So here you see... Uh, Metalib, this crestomity uh, in action. We are looking at one particular style of implementing FSML. Namely, we use internal style with Java and uh, we rely on a fluent API. Okay, so obviously, all these DSL implementations come with a bunch of uh, code snippets, uh, quite obviously. And obviously, each implementation has some sort of name here. And also, quite importantly, um, uh, we have some semantic annotations so that we basically capture important properties um, of all the code snippets. I will say more about this, but it's basically about, for example, the languages used here, the technologies used here, maybe certain concepts at play, like Fluent API and stuff like this. And then the concepts in particular, but also the languages and technologies, they are basically described on uh, a semantic wiki so, so that we have powerful, uh, well-organized documentation on all those DSL implementations. That's basically what MetaLab is. Okay, so let's do this a bit more systematically. So MetaLab, what do we have in this MetaLab? What are the subjects in the MetaLab? Um, well, it's literally a collection of enriched implementations of, in this case, the FSML language. Okay, so we have uh, contributions like this. Uh, they have a short name and a long name. And so you see, for example, uh, there's this quasi quotation example we looked at uh, in, the, in the Haskell case or we use model-driven engineering here with EMF, or we use the language workbench Xtext. Uh, we have some Python internal external implementation, some Java external internal implementation, MPS being another language workbench and meta programming system. So we have a whole bunch of contributions like this that demonstrate the same problem that is um, the FSM language um, how it's implemented in those different systems. Okay, so Christomity, the term, it's from Greek and it's a selection of passages from an author, author designed to help in learning a language. Usually, historically, uh, Christomity has been used as, as a term um, with regard to linguistics, but there's a trend to also use it uh, in software engineering when we talk about um, programming languages rather than um, natural language. Okay, and there's all kinds of software crestomities out there. One well-known example is Rosetta code, but it's of course not about a DSL implementation. It's about programming problems. So there are many different tasks that uh, such as, for example, sorting or all kinds of algorithms and data structure problems, but also network programming, gaming, um, all kinds of tasks that are uh, approached then in different languages uh, to allow for the comparison of um, these languages. Um, my team also has worked on another software crystomity. It's called 101. And there, it's also not about finite state machines or domain specific languages. Uh, in this case, we pick, um, as a running example, we pick a human resources management system, uh, which we think of as a sort of rep representative simple information system. And then we implement it in diverse languages, uh, technologies, and we also vary uh, certain design options. Okay, 
So any sort of software crestomity uh, comes with uh, certain characteristics. Well, at least, you know, a sophisticated uh, crestomity would involve all these things here. I mean, um, you cannot build a software crestomity just by yourself because usually there's a lot of knowledge involved. So it's a community effort. Um, it's quite likely about multiple languages. I mean, in the case of um, the MetaLab Christomity, the languages here are basically the Meta programming languages, right? Uh, you might need some infrastructural support, like, you know, use of GitHub or basically web-based deployment. Uh, you should also use revision and access control so that you can evolve um, the Christomity. You should definitely have some quality assurance so that you can be sure that you have quality contributions to the Christomity. You also might want to have metadata, semantic data on, on your contributions so that they are better, better conceptualized. And maybe also some process management in terms of how you release things, how you improve things. And uh, you might also need a reference specification for the problem that uh, the Christomity is trying to address. And let's look at the reference specification for MetaLib. So, so we should probably have some a grammar for the textual syntax. So here it is. This is a concrete uh, syntax. It's a context-free grammar describing finite state machines. That's part of the reference specification. Um, then here we might also need maybe some meta model for the abstract syntax. I mean, maybe not every implementation is going to have an abstract syntax. For example, we were talking about Rascal. That one didn't have abstract syntax. But if you go for an abstract syntax in your specific implementation, then maybe you can use uh, this meta model here as an inspiration. And then, of course, you also want to define the um, static and dynamic se semantics of your language. So in this case here, uh, what we have, this is a dynamic semantics. Uh, it's a small step operational semantics uh, describing the simulation of finite state machines. And then um, in order to describe the static semantics, there are different ways how we could do it. What we do here is we provide some negative test cases that illustrate violations of certain uh, well-formed constraints that we would have for the FSM. And as we are also talking about um, possibly not just interpretation for finite state machines, but also code generation so that the finite state machine can be uh, executed um, via some other language, uh, you might also provide stereotypical generated code. So, I mean, here it's C code, and this is a very basic uh, pattern that we use here for, for the representation of the FSM. But again, you can use it as an inspiration if you want to write any sort of code generator. And some of the media programming systems, indeed, for example, MPS, uh, they rely on um, code generation. So, okay, so this is as much as I wanted to say about the what. Um, what do we have in the MetaLib? Now let's also talk a little bit about this process management, quality assurance, and other aspects. Uh, in a sense, how do we get the Christomity? How did we get the Christomity? And so we follow basically this sort of process here. Um, and so just to point out, so there are certain kinds of research activities uh, represented with these arrows here. Uh, we use different data sources. And uh, in the end, of course, we want uh, the Christomity. And uh, all these things here are intermediate results. So what we do is we, we basically start with some domain analysis. Which means, you know, what kind of things would we want to 
put into a DSL implementation of SML. Um, well, maybe a syntax implementation, semantics implementation, that sort of thing, right? So this amount of things we want to implement um, gives us our basic feature model. Now, we need to do some sort of sampling. I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of different uh, meta programming options. So we need to perform some theoretical sampling in the sense we need to try to pick some representative examples. You know, for example, rather doing a C sharp and a Java implementation, uh, maybe we should just pick one because maybe they are very similar. So I will say more about this later. And then um, for the sampling, then we come up with, with a bunch of um, implementation approaches that we want to explore. And then we have to actually implement the DSL in these approaches. So we get some actual uh, uh, implementations. And of course, what we try to do is we try to use uh, scientific papers, but also technical documentation in arriving at reasonable DSL implementations that are idiomatic, that are really representative for the underlying meta programming systems or languages. And then we analyze these implementations. Um, so we will probably find that uh, by exercising different um, implementation options, we, um, we actually will find more features because we will see, ah, I could do it like this, I could do it like this. For, for example, I could use an abstract syntax tree or I could have an abstract syntax graph. And by this, just by observing what's going on in the implementations, we then um, get a richer feature model. Okay, and then we also go and say, hmm, let's better characterize all the nuances that we see in these implementations and let's capture them by semantic annotations. Okay, and then what we do is we basically just need to write this down in a, in a, machine readable way so that we maybe can generate some web-based deployment from this. So we use uh, model-based documentation um, to um, actually get not just a Christomity that is stored somewhere on GitHub, but an explorable Christomity because of web deployment. Okay, so this is overall the approach we are using. And here are some bits of the domain analysis that is the feature model uh, that we are using. So whenever we implement the DSL with different approaches, we need to um, decide whether we want to use certain features here or not. So as you see, um, basically at the top of the feature model, we have syntax and semantics. We will always have a syntax implementation. Maybe we will not have a semantics implementation because maybe our implementation just serializes um, the input and then uh, some other implementation takes care of semantics. Okay, this is just at the top. So here's a little bit more detail. So we now have, uh, we, we show a little bit more detail in terms of options that we have for syntax and also options we have for semantics. So for example, for syntax, we might have abstract syntax and concrete syntax, while well, we can have both of them. If we have concrete syntax, it could be textual syntax or graphical syntax. And when we have textual syntax, uh, the most common approach is that we have a parser, but there's also something called projectual editing, um, uh, which I will not explain here. And then when it comes to semantics, we have to think about dynamic semantics or static semantics, and then there's a also the translation based semantics that, you know, for example, as we showed with the code generation uh, example where we had C code for a finite state machine. Okay. So the theoretical sampling we did in order to have a manageable numbers of meter programming systems and uh, languages is we said, okay, we would definitely want to cover mainstream languages, right? Uh, I mean, we, we don't just want to stick to, let's say, potentially obscure research-oriented approaches. 
Um, we also want to cover different programming paradigms. So we want to see how it works in OO, we want to see how it works in functional programming, for example. Um, we also want to cover different DSL implementation styles. I mean, things like internal versus external. And we also want to cover different technological spaces like, you know, grammarware versus modelware. And then uh, we definitely want to cover the basic feature model uh, as we were just showing, right? So, I mean, we definitely want to have once a generator or once a dynamic semantics. And um, we also want to basically uh, exercise all the other features that I was showing. And this is basically the initial set of implementations we had. I was already showing this a little bit. So here we show the languages and technologies. And for example, I mean, these, these are obviously like Java, Python, that's like the mainstream languages. And you see sometimes we add extra technologies, uh, like for example, when we have internal implementations, while well, we don't need any parser technologies, when it's external, we use Antler. And you see, it goes on like this. And down here, for example, we have the modelware option, or with MPS, Spoofox, and Rascal, we have meter programming systems. So there's uh, there's lots of different options here. Okay, and so the implementation development goes on on GitHub. There's uh, this repo here where we organize all these uh, different implementations, and that's a straightforward implementation effort. Except that obviously we need the expertise to to do all these implementations. Yes. And then basically once we're done with doing all these implementations, uh, and just, this of course might go in rounds, uh, we, we want to analyze uh, these implementations and we want to see how they are different. Um, so we do this here just for the abstract syntax uh, sub-feature. So you want to discover basically different ways of doing abstract syntax uh, on the grounds of the implementations that we were just discussing okay so for example here uh, we look at what is it uh, it's actually a, a model driven engineering option so we use uh, Eclipse modeling framework and what do we have here uh, based on the meta model that we use in this um, in this implementation, the instances of the meta model, that is the FSM models, can be serialized. So we have a serialization support for the abstract syntax here, because this is how this EMF uh, approach works. You or here we have the option, uh, this is uh, apparently a Java-based option, uh, where we use an API to support the abstract syntax. So it's, it's literally an API, as you see, there's an interface um, for um, adding states, adding transitions to an FSM, right? So, so it's, it's, this is not like a bunch of classes, it's really, uh, we have a bunch of interfaces to describe the um, API that's used in this case for uh, FSM construction yeah and it happens so it's a so-called fluent api which means um by certain uh idioms such as method chaining uh it's very convenient to assemble fsms okay so apis um or here we have uh some implementation of um an i mean an actual class hierarchy a bunch of classes for um, the abstract syntax of FSMs. It so happens that also um, it's the classes from the EMF-based uh, implementation. And well, the way it works here is, and because uh, we use meta modeling underneath, we really have an abstract syntax graph. Um, so this, this even means um, um, in an extreme case, we could have not just tree shape, but we could have uh, typically um, some some references, for example, from transitions to states, right? Okay.
or here what it what is this this is um, a Scala based uh, implementation of the abstract syntax so we use so-called case classes which correspond to what's called abstract data types pretty much in Haskell so this is really a tree based approach to to uh, abstract syntax um, and here we have um, some snippet from an X text based implementation where we illustrate the notion of resolution. So the idea is here when in this X text like uh, notation, which is also very similar to Antler, um, uh, you, you can actually resolve uh, the target state that you mention here in a transition, you can resolve it to the actual object um, for the target state. Okay, I mean X text helps you with uh, doing this resolution. Okay, so we're almost done with uh, the implementation analysis of this abstract syntax feature in terms of all the different implementations, how they um, instantiate abstract syntax in different ways. Okay, here we see a fi final uh, option, namely <clears throat> some implementations actually might use not just a true abstract syntax, but um, they might use some what we call semantic domains, which are already much closer to executing uh, the final state machine here. Look at this. So here what we do is we represent a hash map mapping, um, what is it, um, states to and events to actions and target state pairs, right? So, so this is basically already the simulation data structure. So it's it's somewhere in between abstract syntax and actual interpretation. So it's an interesting um, option, nevertheless. All right, and so then uh, we do this implementation analysis for all the features. So you have the features here on the on the left, and here you have the different implementations. And so, so we can basically look at um, our feature model. And of course, we want to have maybe some good coverage for, for all the features here. Yes, and then we can better understand the differences between these implementations. All right. And I was talking a little bit about semantic annotation, that we basically put tags, labels, whatever you want to call it, on the various uh, code snippets of the implementation. I mean, quite obviously, we annotate all the code snippets with the features of the domain analysis that we just discussed. Also quite obvious, we just maintain what languages we are using in the snippets, what technologies we are using in the snippets. A little bit more interesting is this concept stuff here. So, so we basically point out important software engineering or programming concepts that are relevant in the code that we see here. And then remember, this is also, these concepts are also described separately on a semantic wiki. And uh, we might also kind of annotate the code here in terms of the perspective, or you could say the role this code plays. I mean, uh, it's always about some feature, but you know we might be concerned with actual code implementation, or we might be concerned with data, right? Or we might see some test code, right? And so, uh, yeah, this is how we annotate things here. And again, um, the concepts in particular are described on a semantic wiki, right? So, of course. How do we arrive at the list of concepts that we might want to talk about in those implementations? Um, that's, that's a little bit tricky, right? You want to be a little bit systematic here. And so what we are doing here, we use basic techniques of information retrieval uh, that we apply to scholarly articles so that we basically figure out the interesting uh, terms from those articles, right? So here you see 
a bunch of articles that we looked at for different media programming languages and systems. And then here you see the terms that popped up uh, as distinguished terms, so to say, in, in these uh, papers. So, and then what we do is uh, we try to basically um, turn these terms into concepts by, you know, some further reflection. Anyways, after using um, input from information retrieval, um, we basically arrived at semantic annotations for the implementations of, of that kind here. Um, okay. And this is how we, this is how we document everything. Uh, so we basically use a model based documentation format. Uh, so basically every code snippet has this sort of documentation model attached to it. So obviously we say, um, you know, short name of the implementation. Uh, we also give a pointer into GitHub. We give a long name and we specify the features. Uh, we specify the perspective. We list languages, technologies and concepts used. And then we also give all the uh, snippets that are part of it here. Okay. So maybe finally, if if it isn't clear already, why are we building such a collection of uh, DSL implementations? So, as, as I said, Christomity means it's a collection useful for learning. So, what are the scenarios for learning or teaching that we think are supported by such a Christomity? Um, you know, uh, you might want to see an example of a DSL implementation that uses an API, that might be your question. You, you want to understand what does it mean that a DSL implementation uses an API. Then you can basically look for implementations that um, instantiate that feature. Okay. Uh, you might wonder what is a Fluent API. Well, you can, you can search for Fluent API. You find obviously an explanation on the Semantic Wiki 101. But you also find the relevant implementations. Uh, so we have uh, here Java Fluent internal, Python internal, and Rascal apparently also um, uses a, a Fluent API. Okay. Um, and then you actually also want to find not just an implementation that uses an API. You want to be you want to be pinpointed to the specific place in the implementation where the API is implemented. And because we use these very precise uh, semantic annotations, uh, things are pretty clear. Um, or you might want to compare things, right? So you understand that there's a fluent and an influent uh, API approach. Um, and you want to see it back to back, right? Okay, this is maybe everything I wanted to say. So, a thing like Metalib or any Christomity for that matter is, of course, uh, never finished. Uh, to be honest, the project is slightly uh, stuck right now. Probably has to do with um, my very long sabbatical at Facebook for a few years. Um, but, but it should probably be restarted. Um, and so we would always want to add more contributions. We would maybe add also a few more features. We might also want to improve our theoretical sampling to have better coverage of the reality of meter programming. Um, we might want to advance our use of information retrieval techniques to uh, more reliably drive uh, the extraction of concepts that we want to cover um, uh, in, in those uh, semantic annotations. And while the 101 wiki in itself is also permanent construction place, uh, might want to improve the quality of all the documentation that is hosted there. And, uh, you know, some cross validation should happen. You know, for example, maybe we didn't understand how to use MPS or Rascal. Uh, maybe someone else should also try it out. And uh, we should probably find out how we can actually validate the assumption that uh, Metalib is useful for learning. So we should probably evaluate it in the classroom. Okay.
So that's all I wanted to say about all those meta programming options for this L implementation and how we approach this uh, problem with Metalib. Thank you.